Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian. And I know you're thinking, wasn't she wearing that? The last video, and the answer is yes. I've tried to fool you a little bit by changing my lighting, but but it's it's the same me. I'm recording this intro at the same time as I did for the last Dinner Bodice video. Here I'm going to be talking about the skirts that I need to make today, because here I am in the past, and you know if that Dinner Bodice worked out. However, I at this current time do not know if it worked out, but in any case, I hope I'm moving on to make the skirts for this costume, which is what I'll be doing here today in this video. Again, I'll be using truly Victorian patterns for these two pieces, the underskirt and the overskirt. I'll be using their four gore underskirt pattern, which looks like this, and then also one of their asymmetric draped overskirt patterns, which looks like this. Um, I don't have the pattern numbers memorized, but again, they'll be here on screen and then linked in the description below as usual. And I really am relying on those truly Victorian patterns to not lead me astray and hopefully go together quite nicely because I just don't have time to make mock-ups for these skirts. So I'll be jumping straight into the final silk version. So, you know, <laughs> think good vibes for me. Again, you know how the rest of this is going and I here in the past do not. So hopefully everything's gone well and comes together nicely. So let's jump on into making these skirts. All right, again, here are the two patterns from Truly Victorian I will be using to make my underskirt and overskirt. This first one, I'll be doing the very simple, smooth version here in the center on the left here. Um, no, no rouging or trimming going on, just a very simple underskirt to use for now. And then for the overskirt, I actually end up doing a little bit of a change and not using the back of this pattern, but I'll talk about that more in a minute here. Here are some inspiration images from the 1880s as well. These are all different fashion plates from different years and things like that, but mid 1880s overskirt situation, uh, a lot of asymmetric drapes, a lot of long, large bows and things like that that were inspiring me to make my design as well, or to decide what I wanted to go for. And in a few fashion plates, like the one on the right here, I did see that there were tassels and long cords and almost like curtain tie back <laughs> cords used in overskirt designs. And I had bought a vintage rayon tassel with a big thick cord on it to use on my overskirt as well. So I wanted to incorporate that. So seeing images like this were what convinced me to go ahead and buy that tassel. It was actually a vintage tassel that Duchess Trading was selling on Etsy. They have a lot of antique trimmings and I will link their shop below. So here's my little sketch for these skirts, basically the simple underskirt and then the asymmetrically draped overskirt. Again, trying to loop that big tassel rope situation through a bow. This was kind of my idea of how I was going to do that. And in general, I should just stay say here at the start, I made these skirts in a day and a half, both the underskirt and the overskirt. I made them last Friday and then Saturday morning, which was Halloween, of course. So I needed to finish on Halloween so I could wear this costume on Halloween and film and edit and put up that video that I put up on Halloween. So I didn't um, perhaps film every single step here and I was going quite quickly, but yet trying not to rush. So just a little bit of a caveat here at the start. Again, I cut out this truly Victorian underskirt pattern. There are three pieces to this pattern for a, um, and two of them are cut on the fold and one is not. So you end up with four total pieces for your skirt, but I added four inches to the hem of each of those just so that I would know that the skirt was gonna be long enough. I figured if all else failed, I could always cut a little bit off, but it's hard to add anything back on. So here are my pieces laid out on the green silk, of course, and I went ahead and cut those out of the silk and of a layer of black cotton muslin. And then here's the front of the overskirt pattern. I decided to go ahead and cut out the front in green silk and then also in black cotton voile to interline that. And then also I cut out a third one of the skirt front in muslin um, for the overskirt front here because I wanted to try and drape this and like pin it how they describe to pleat it and then try it on the back to see if I wanted to use the same pattern piece, the front pattern piece, as my skirt back as well. Um, so I ended up using the front overskirt pattern here for the front and for the back. I had cut it out in muslin to see what it looked like and I ended up liking it. So then I went ahead and cut out the front again in silk. This time I cut it out a little bit longer and a little bit wider just because I wanted a little bit of extra room to use this front piece on the back or for the back of my overskirt. This is suddenly very hard to explain and very confusing. Great. After cutting everything out, my first step was of course to baste my fashion fabric to my interlining. So that's what I've done here. This is for the underskirt. I started by making the underskirt first because I figured if I didn't finish the overskirt, at least I would have one skirt to wear. So here are my side front overskirt pieces. Everything is all basted together again. Um, I used that white cotton thread again, just like I had for the bodice and basted the black muslin interlining and uh, silk taffeta fashion fabric together all along the outside edges and even down into the darts here again, just like I did for the bodice, I basted down into the dart fullness um, that would be encapsulated in the dart um, just to make sure the layers didn't move around on me where I didn't want them to. So here I am just pinning those darts. There are dart, there is a dart 
there is a dart in each of the side front pieces. And then the center front of this skirt has two darts in it. It was cut along the fold um, to, you know, kind of encompass the most of the front here. And that has two darts in it as well. So I was just pinning all my darts after I had everything basted, which of course was taking, took up the majority of my early Friday, I suppose, basting all these pieces together. Over here on the machine, I'm actually starting by sewing two pieces of a rectangle together. This is actually the waistband for my uh, underskirt here. Uh, they suggested cutting it on the fold, but I didn't want to waste any more fabric, so I actually took this out of a spare piece of fabric and just ended up stitching it together along the center. You know, I didn't want to have to cut it on the fold. Just to conserve fabric was the name of the game with a lot of this, just because, again, I still want to make sure I have enough fabric left to do a day bodice for this, and then hopefully a ball bodice as well. So conserving fabric there with the waistband, and then I went ahead and started sewing all of my darts. Again, just starting at the large end of the dart, sewing off the end, and then tying the ends of my darts. This just keeps bulk to a minimum at the ends of my darts, and it's what I like to do for all darts that I sew, honestly. As you all know, if you've been around here, Again, you can see I'm still using that dark green cotton Guterman thread here in the machine. Um, I did eventually run out of this after I finished about, I got about halfway through the overskirt before I ran out of this cotton thread and had to switch over to just regular black polyester Guterman thread because I ran out of cotton thread, you know? I actually ran out of this white basting thread after this project too, but I, I made it right to the end. I have a little bit of this white cotton thread left, but I just had my four darts to sew and then I can start sewing the side seams for this. Luckily, this skirt does go together quite quickly. It's not very difficult to assemble or make. Again, it's just the tediousness of doing all the hand stitching that I wanted to do for this. And even though I was still on this kind of, you know, tight deadline here. I still wanted to do everything properly. I didn't want to rush this or do it sloppily. Um, if anything, I took the most time on the underskirt and then was the most sloppy when it came to trimming the overskirt because that was kind of stuff that if I was doing it sloppy, I could take off and redo later. I just needed to slap some bows on there, you know, for the day. Um, and here I am with my darts pressed open. I can pin my side seams together along the front here. The three panels that make up the front of the underskirt are rather A-line shaped. And again, very easy to go together, quite straight seams. So I'm just pinning those together within the seam allowance and then I can stitch them together here or back over on the machine. Again, this is the Friday before Halloween that I'm stitching all this year. And I was figuring, again, make the overskirt first. That way, at least I have some sort of skirt to wear with this bodice if I could only get so far. But I had been planning for so long to make that getting dressed as a vampire video that I put out on Saturday night that I just knew I really wanted to get it, uh, the skirts done in time to be able to make that video. So. I was quite determined to make it happen, even though, even though, you know, making a Victorian underskirt fully interlined and overskirt in a day and a half probably isn't wise. And at this point, I was thinking probably wasn't doable, but I had to do it. And so I did, because that's just me. You know, I'm a little bit bonkers. Who needs to sleep? No one's getting any sleep in the last 10 days anyway, right? Right. And foreseeably, we're not going to get any more sleep either. So just might as well focus on something mindless like basting skirt pieces together honestly at this point at least it feels a little bit productive somehow Ugh. but uh, i wanted to get this costume done for halloween i was determined i had already like bought fake vampire fangs and like fit them to my teeth and like i was ready to go with the hair comb and jewelry and i had everything almost ready it was just the finishing the costume so that i could put that video together and i actually did end up shooting that video in one take hence why we have the bolster pillow going on a journey and I dropped the bodice at one point I have to pick it back up but I was just rolling with it because I only had a little bit of time to film that video edit that video and get it up before Halloween was over once I had my side seams stitched I could go ahead and press the seam allowance open and then whip stitch the raw edges like I did for the bodice as well like I'd done for the bodice as well I suppose um, I did make my stitches a little bit longer for this just because it's the skirt it's not going to get a lot of like friction against it um, it's just going to be laying against the petticoat so hopefully it will be fine in there. As for the opening to get in and out of the skirt, the Truly Victorian pattern has you just turn over the seam allowances um, between the side panel, one of the side front panels and the back. Um, so you just turn over the seam allowances like so. I stitched those down as they recommended and then I felled down the seam allowance to encase that raw edge and then I felled it down just to the interlining. So there's no stitches on the outside for that felling but it just holds everything in place inside. You could add a placket in here with some snaps perhaps as well for a very finished look. Of course, I didn't have time to do that this time, but perhaps in the future. Then it was time to sew the skirt down onto the waistband, and I'm sorry that the machine is shaking the tripod, so we 
here and have a bit of an earthquake situation here. Um, the front of the skirt has those darts to shape it and that's just being sewn down to the waistband smooth, but the very back panel of the skirt, it just says to like pleat it to the waistband and it doesn't exactly tell you how or give you a diagram or anything. So I ended up just marking where the center back was going to be on my waistband with like a pin and you can see I'm sewing over a bunch of pins here and very many layers of silk on these pleats and luckily this machine can power through anything. A lot of people use these old machines for working with leather and stuff like that so it's no trouble to sew through this many layers of fabric and it avoided these ultra fine pins like a champion and yes again as I always say in every video yes I'm sorry I do sew over my pins. Um, it's just a disclaimer I have to include in every video, otherwise people will yell at me. It's all, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. It works for me. It may not work for everyone. But in the back here, I just knife pleated the skirt panel down facing towards the center. So on the right side, I faced the knife pleats toward the center of the back. And on the left side, I faced the knife pleats towards the center again. So just instead of knife pleating it all in one direction, like all to the left or all to the right, I just faced them towards the center back. Hopefully that makes some sense. Ooh, I'm sorry. I promise I'll make another Victorian skirt someday and do this in a lot more detail and give myself so much time and like give myself a week to make it <laughs> and then I won't be rushing like this. Here I am stitching over those pleats in the back again and you'll see me taking out some of my pins as I go this time. Um, I just wanted to put an additional line of stitching over those pleats because it's so heavy back here with the silk and the anter lining. I just wanted to make sure these pleats stayed down and secured to the waistband so I just ended up putting an extra line of stitching in here just to make myself feel a little bit more comfortable about that. You can see I'm just about to run out of that cotton thread there and have to switch over to black thread, but that's all right. I made it through the underskirt at least. And to finish off the waistband of the underskirt, I am just going to be turning that waistband an inch and then an inch again down on the inside. And then I ended up felling that down along the inside. Again, no stitches will show on the outside, but it was just a fast way to finish that. So I felt like that was accurate enough. And then I just had to hem this underskirt and I used a four inch wide strips of bias cut out of the muslin for this. Um, a hem facing was a very historically accurate way to finish skirts like this. And like if they got dirty, they could be taken off and replaced, things like that. So um, I just wanted to go ahead and do it the historic way, which seemed to be using a wide hem facing or a bias facing like this one. So I went ahead, stitched that on by machine along the outside and then hand stitched it down along the inside, which of course I got zero footage of my apologies. And with the underskirt done, I could go ahead and move on to working on the overskirt. This is Friday night about maybe 11 p.m. here where I'm, you see me now, uh, maybe 11 midnight-ish is where we're at. So I'm hand basting the voile layer and the silk taffeta layer together for one of the overskirt panels. Again, I cut them both using the same pattern piece. The back I cut a little bit larger, but the same general idea. I was going to use the same pleating pattern, all that jazz. But here I am just working on the front of the overskirt by sewing the two fronts together, the fashion fabric and the interlining along in the seam allowance. And by sewing, I mean basting. You can see what I'm doing. I'm just using waxed white cotton thread again for that. And then I could put the pattern piece down, the truly Victorian pattern piece neck down over the top of this and start marking where all their indications for pleats were. So you can see all these markings along the side of the pattern here. That's showing you how to pleat the side of this to get the desired effect, basically, to get the effect that they promise on the packaging. So I went ahead and I'm you know, about to point with a colored pencil here because normally I would mark things with colored pencil. We've seen me do it all the time. But actually for this, I ended up indicating where the pleats need to be with pins and just pinning them as I went along and pinned all the pleats in place along this curve. So I just needed to mark all of these pleats here with some pins, you know, the kind of the start of the pleat, the end of the pleat. And I just follow the diagram for the truly Victorian pattern quite closely here. They also recommended hemming at the bottom edge and the long like asymmetric side of this at this point um, by turning in a half inch and then an inch as well. So that is what I've done here. I've turned those in. And then because I have this all interlined, I can stitch that down just to the interlining for a completely clean finish on the outside. So here I am slip stitching this all down with some black silk thread, um, just again, catching the edge of the taffeta and then sewing into the interlining alone so that no stitches show on the outside. This is a very clean and nice finish, I think. Um, but the only problem with this is because it's stitched to the interlining, it's kind of like free hanging in here. So air gets caught between the two layers. So it kind of gets kind of pillowy sometimes, like when you're putting the skirt on, because you have to arrange it a little bit more than perhaps you would have to if you had actually stitched through here, but I didn't want any stitches to show. Eh. Um, of course, if you were attaching any trimming on the outside of this over this area, and therefore you could stitch into it and then have the stitches be hidden, that would solve all of these problems. So while this is a very clean way of doing this, 
um, and I feel like it worked for this particular skirt. I'm not exactly positive I would do it this way again next time, just depending on how I wanted the final thing to look and lay, I suppose. Um, this is just a little bit pillowy because the layers are not exactly stitched all the way through here. They're just stitched to the interlining, which ho hopefully all that made sense. I'm so sorry. It's election week. You're going to have to forgive me if my brain is made of scrambled eggs. Like, please. Um, I feel like those old commercials, this is your brain on election week and like it's just a frying pan. Forgive me. Here I am basting across the pleats after I have them pinned in place. There are pleats along the waist here, which is what I'm stitching over right now, just to baste those while I work. And then there are the other pleats that I was showing you earlier along that curve. Those are along the side. So these pleats are up here along the waist, where we'll be tucked into the waistband eventually here. And then the other pleats are down the side of the skirt. So here are the other ones along that curve there. Again, I'm just going to sew over these pins. My apologies. Just to baste these down within the seam allowance to make them all stay as I have them pinned. And I have them pinned according to the pattern, so, you know. I deviated from the pattern a bit here with the overskirt, but not for the front of it, so uh, basically I'm making the front of the overskirt according to the pattern's instructions, and then I will do that again and make another front in reverse to use as the back, because I just didn't use the back of this pattern. Again, I hope I'm making any sense today. Please, please forgive me. But once I had the front constructed like that, this is actually now Saturday morning, I then on Saturday morning made the back using all those same steps, basting everything together, pleating everything, basting the pleats, um, and then I can go ahead and sew the front and the back together along the side pleated sections. So those curved edges that are pleated, that's where I sewed the front and the back of the skirt over skirt together. So here I'm sewing over those pleats, but over both layers. So I'm sewing them together along that like rouged side. The other side has like open, smooth hanging areas. And this side has the like, looks like it's been pulled up by that cord eventually that I put with the bow. At least hypothetically, that's the idea. So I'm just finagling that through the machine here so I can get all those layers together. Of course, with the fashion fabric and the interlining, things can get a little bit thick. And then I decided to go ahead and cover this seam with a length of like Petersham ribbon I had laying around. Um, I wanted to finish it somehow without just having to whip stitch it. So I figured I would whip stitch it to this ribbon to cover that seam. And then I realized this was actually going to be quite useful because that ribbon that extends up here into, you can see it's whip stitched over that seam. It extends up into the waistband where it will be caught in the waistband and help distribute the weight of those pleats at the waist as opposed to just on themselves. So actually this provides some structural relief to the skirt. Um, as well as kind of covering that nasty seam allowance. So um, providing lots of different functions, this little piece of ribbon that I stitched on here, so that's lucky. And then here again for the waistband, all I had to do was turn that an inch and then an inch again. This waistband is a little bit wide. Um, maybe it's supposed to finish an inch and a half. I don't know. But I just ended up turning it until it was a one inch waistband because that's what I like to have. Um, so I just am pinning this over that seam allowance along the inside and I will go ahead again and fell this down. I can't remember if I felled it or slip stitched it, honestly. Saturday morning? Wasn't that like a year ago? Who knows? Um, so I'm just turning that waistband down to finish it. Again, the you know back of the overskirt was constructed just as I did the front, so I had already hemmed the bottom and the side of it. Hopefully you know what I mean. So there is that. And now we're actually cutting to the future here, because this is post-Halloween uh, bow demonstration time. Um, this is how I made the bow on Halloween, but I didn't actually film the one I made on that day, because I was at that, at that point I was like, make a bow! throw on the costume, do your hair, and like go. So I was like rushing in a new, whole new level at that point. So here's how I made the bow for my overskirt on the day. I'm just making another one here to demonstrate. I did not exactly measure anything to make this bow. It was a very slapdash bow. Again, I tried to be careful and nice with the underskirt and the overskirt itself, but when it came to the trimmings, that was where I was seriously rushing. So for this bow, I just took two pieces of the taffeta that were like off cuts from cutting out other parts of this whole project. And I didn't measure them or anything. They were just, you know, the same. And then I cut out black taffeta to match those rectangles, just like this you see I'm doing here. And instead of this making two bows, this is, I'm creating one side, uh, like two sides of one bow here. And then I will use the smaller little length of green taffeta to create like the center of the bow. So I sewed those along the lengths and then I turned them right side out, ironed those into place, 
I thought it was a good idea to line these with a contrasting fabric just for a tiny touch of something a little bit more. Um, of course, the taffeta itself is quite iridescent, so it would look dark inside the bow anyway, but I just decided to exaggerate that by using black taffeta on the inside instead. Um, this, I'm just turning one end of this in by a half inch to finish these bows. This is like the super quick way to do this. And then I slip the raw edged side inside there, pin along this area, and then I just stitched over this. It's going to be the inside of the bow. No one will ever see it. You could do this, you know, very nicely in some other way if you wish to, but this was my how to do this very quickly way. Again, this little tube here will end up being the center of my bow. So I'm just turning that real fast, pressing that into place. I just press that with the seam allowance along the inside. And then for these two little bow ends, I'm just stitching those together. Hopefully you get what I just did there. I just, you know, folded one end of the tube in on itself to create a finished edge and then stuck the other side in there and then pinned it in place. Hopefully you see what I'm doing. Goodness knows this was, you know, the most rushed bit again. So <clears throat> apologies. So now that I have these little tubes, or like cuffs almost, I pleated one side of them down like this to create the sides of my bows. So you can see how this is starting to become a bow here. I'm just using this thick needle so the silk is fighting me on it, but I've just whipped a few stitches here through all those pleats. And then I will sew this to the other side with that little center thing around them. So go ahead and take one side of my bow and the other side, stitch those together, and then I will use this as the center. Again, hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. Um, luckily, this demonstration is just as sloppy as the real bow I made, so it's very accurate, honestly. Imagine me at like 2 p.m. on Halloween, knowing that I wanted to get that video up that night, making the other bow. <laughs> um, I, of course, made long ribbon tails for that bow that I put on the overskirt as well. Um, but again, that's just rectangles, spare rectangles of fabric in both the green and the black to create like long ribbon tails to go underneath the bow. And I just stitched those down to the overskirt first and then stitched the bow on top of them. And for that, you'll see in a second here, I slipped the tassels in between this little center section that you see me stitching on here to this bow. Um, before I stitched that on, I looped the tassels through it on the actual overskirt. So you'll see that in just a moment when I transfer over here. So here's my overskirt. Here's the big bow that's on here, again, with that black on the inside. And you can see I just slipped the cord of the big tassels through that center, stitched it down so it wouldn't move around. So that's how my tassels are looped through here. It's actually very removable if I were to decide, decide to use this on something else or retrim this overskirt. And here are the long hanging ribbony bits as well. Just again, off cuts from cutting out other parts of the project. I didn't want to use any of the length of my fabric, but I just knew I wanted something, some sort of trimming on here. And I had a tiny few minutes of time to throw some trimmings together. And somehow it all worked out in the end. I don't even know how. Somehow this came together. You should let me know. I'm going to pin this extra bow here on top of this one. Let me know if you like it or not. I'm probably going to take it off. I don't think it's needed, I suppose. Or I might use it on the other side somehow. Create another giant bow for the other side of this and have it like draped from the waistline down. I haven't finalized my trimming options on this. Let's be, let's be real. I trimmed it on the day but I think this deserves a little bit more thought and my brain doesn't have any room for cute trimming overskirt thoughts right now. So we'll get back to it um, after a little bit of rest, perhaps, you know, but with that, my overskirt was finished and I could get dressed, put this costume on and make my getting dressed in 1885, but you're a vampire video. Here is the truly Victorian foregore underskirt all on its own without the overskirt on top of it. This did come out a tiny bit long. I would have, you know, in hindsight, taken off a half inch here probably. I don't know that it's worth it to me to take it apart and to shorten it that half inch just because I don't really plan on wearing this outside very often. You know, probably just for that one spin or two out and about because I don't have exactly any outdoor events or anything to wear this to. So I'm not too worried about it being a little bit long since most of the time I will be wearing this 
here indoors on set. It's the only place I foresee wearing it at least for the next year or so, <laughs> you know. But overall, I am really happy with how this underskirt came together. It was actually very easy to put together. It just, you know, took me time because of all the hand basting and the whip stitching and things like that. So, of course, those things took time. But in general, this is a very quick skirt to put together. If I were to make this out of say a cotton and we're able to maybe serge the seams, it would go together quite quickly. And then here of course is the overskirt on top of that as well. Of course the overskirts are much more fun and floofy and have a lot going on. Um, I did, you know, a brush a little bit when it came to the trimmings of this overskirt, but uh, the, again, hand basting the layers together and the turning of the hems and all that, I was taking my time and doing that by hand. Um, it just when it was time to like slap a bow on there on Halloween morning, that was where I was kind of like, okay, rushing a little bit, but because all those nasty stitches are hidden on the back of the bows. No one will ever know that things are, you know, perhaps not the best underneath my bows. These are things that no one will ever find out except for me telling you here now. Do let me know if you think I should keep this second bow on here or, you know, add more. I kind of want to add more of the like ribbon sort of things on the other side, but again, maybe after I've done the other two bodices I want to do in this because only if I have enough fabric do I really want to do that. Because I left the ruffle off the underskirt, I originally when I was buying fabric, had planned to put the ruffle along the underskirt that is part of this pattern, but because I left that off again to conserve fabric, hopefully I will have enough to eke out that ball bodice, the day bodice, and then make some additional trimmings for this overskirt. We'll just have to see. This is not the end of the Cicada Gown Project videos here on the channel. I will have a little bit of a break coming up here. I'm gonna have a couple of vintage videos that I have planned here. I wanna get to some more vintage and retro content for the next couple of videos, but then we will jump back in and do the day bodice for this cicada gown. And then hopefully after that, we'll have enough fabric to eke out that ball gown bodice as well. So stay tuned on that. More costuming will be coming up eventually, but I'm just gonna get back to some of my more usual content here as well and mix it up. Thank you all so much for your comments and your support on this project of mine. I know it's a bit different than the other content I've ever made really here on YouTube. And I really appreciate your support as I kind of experimented with costuming here. And I really hope you've enjoyed everything. Thank you also, especially to my patrons who have of course have made this project possible and make my work possible continuing my work possible as do you by watching these videos so thank you all so much for your support i'll be back here next week with another skirt sewing project funny enough and i will see you all then bye